Ananda, there are many people in the world who do not seek what is eternal, and they cannot yet renounce the kindness and love they feel for their wives. But they have no interest in deviant sexual activity, and so develop a purity and produce light. When the life ends, they draw near the sun and moon, and among those born in the heaven of the four kings. Those whose sexual love for their wives is slight, but who have not yet obtained the entire flavor of dwelling in purity, transcend the light of sun and moon at the end of their lives and reside at the summit of the human realm. They are among those born in the triastimsa heaven. Those who become temporarily involved when they meet with desire, but who forget about it when it is finished, and who, while in the human realm, are active less and quiet more, abide at the end of their lives in light and emptiness, where the illumination of sun and moon does not reach. These beings have their own light, and they are among those born in the Suyama heaven. Those who are quiet all the time, but are not yet able to resist when stimulated by contact, ascend at the end of their lives through a subtle and ethereal place, they will not be drawn into the lower realms. The destruction of the realms of humans and gods and the obliteration of kalpas by the three disasters will not reach them, for they are among those born in the Tushita heaven. Those who are devoid of desire, but who will engage in it for the sake of their partner, even the flavor of doing so is like the flavor of chewing wax, are born at the end of their lives in a place transcending transformations. They are among those born in the heaven of bliss by transformation. Those who have no kind of worldly thoughts while doing what worldly people do, who are lucid and beyond such activity while involved in it, are capable at the end of their lives of entirely transcending states where transformations may be present or may be lacking. They are among those born in the heaven of comfort from others' transformations. Anandar, Thus it is that although they have transcended the physical in these six heavens, the traces to their minds still become involved. For that, they'll have to pay in person. These are called the six desire heavens. Anandar, all those in the world who cultivate their minds, but do not avail themselves of dhyana, and so have no wisdom, can only control their bodies so as not to engage in sexual desire. Whether walking, or sitting, or in their thoughts, they are totally devoid of it. Since they do not give rise to defiling love, they do not remain in the realm of desire. These people can, in response to their thought, take on the bodies of Brahma beings. They are among those in the heaven of the multitudes of Brahma. In those whose hearts of desire have already been cast aside, the mind apart from desire manifests. They have a form regard for the rules of discipline and delight in being accord with them. These people can practice the Brahma virtue at all times, and they are among those in the heaven of the ministers of Brahma, those whose bodies and minds are wonderfully perfect, and whose awesome department is not in the least deficient are pure in the prohibitive precepts and have a thorough understanding of them as well. At all times these people can go govern the Brahma multitudes as great Brahma lords, and they are among those in the great Brahma heaven. Anandar, those who flow to these three superior levels will not be oppressed by any suffering or affliction, although they have not developed proper samadhi. Their minds are pure to the point that they are not moved by outflows. This is called the first dhyana. Anandar, those beyond the Brahma heavens gather in and govern the Brahma beings, for their Brahma conduct is perfect and fulfilled. Unmoving and with settled mind, they produce light in profound stillness, and they are among those in the heaven of lesser light. Those whose lights illumine each other in an endless, dazzling blaze shine throughout the realms of the ten directions so that everything becomes like crystal. They are among those in the heaven of limitless light. 
Those who take in and hold the light to perfection accomplish the substance of the teaching, creating and transforming the purity into endless responses and functions. They are among those in the light sound heaven. Ananda, those who flow to these three superior levels will not be oppressed by worries or vexations, although they have not developed proper samadhi. Their minds are pure to the point that they have subdued their causal outflows. This is called the second dhyana. Ananda, heavenly beings for whom the perfection of light has become sound, and who further open up the sound to disclose its wonder, discover a subtler level of practice. They penetrate to the bliss of still extinction, and among those in a heaven of lesser purity. Those in whom the emptiness of purity manifests are led to discover its boundlessness. Their bodies and minds experience like ease, and they accomplish the bliss of still extinction. They are among those in the heaven of limitless purity. Those for whom the world, the body and the mind are all perfectly pure, have accomplished the virtue of purity, and a superior level emerges. They return to the bliss of still extinction, and they are among those in the heaven of pervasive purity. Ananda, those who flow to these three superior levels will be replete with great compliance. Their bodies and minds are at peace, and obtain limitless bliss. Although they have not obtained proper samadhi, the joy within the tranquility of their minds is total. This is called the third dhyana. Moreover, Ananda, heavenly beings whose bodies and minds are not oppressed, put an end to the cause of suffering, and realize that bliss is not permanent; that sooner or later it will come to an end. Suddenly, they simultaneously renounce both thoughts of suffering and thoughts of bliss. Their coarse and heavy thoughts are extinguished, and they give rise to the nature of purity and blessings. They are among those in the heaven of the birth of blessings. Those whose renunciation of these thoughts is in perfect fusion gain a purity of superior understanding. Within these unimpeded blessings, they obtain a wonderful compliance that extends to the bounds of the future. They are among those in the blessed love heaven. Ananda, from that heaven, there are two ways to go. Those who extend the previous thought into limitless pure light, and who perfect and clarify the blessings and virtue, cultivate and are certified to one of these dwellings. They are among those in the abundant fruit heaven. Those who extend the previous thought into a dislike of both suffering and bliss, so that the intensity of their thought to renounce them continues without cease, will end up by totally renouncing the way. Their bodies and minds will become extinct. Their thoughts will become like dead ashes. For five hundred eons, these beings will perpetuate the cause for production and extinction, being unable to discover the nature which is neither produced nor extinguished. During the first half of these eons, they will undergo extinction. During the second half, they will experience production. They are among those in the heaven of no thought. Ananda, those who flow to these four superior levels will not be moved by any suffering or bliss in any world. Although this is not the unconditioned or the true ground of non-moving, because they still have the thought of obtaining something, their functioning is nonetheless quite advanced. This is called the fourth dhyana. Beyond this, Ananda. Other five heavens of no return, for those who have completely cut off the nine categories of habits in the lower realms, neither suffering nor bliss exists, and there is no regression to the lower levels. All whose minds have achieved this renunciation dwell in these heavens together. Ananda, those who have put an end to suffering and bliss. And who do not get involved in the contention between such thoughts among those in the heaven of no affliction, those who isolate their practice, whether in movement or in restraint, 
investigating the baselessness of that involvement are among those in the heaven of no heat. Those whose vision is wonderfully perfect and clear view the realms of the ten directions as free of defiling appearances, devoid of all dirt and filth. They are among those in the heaven of good view. Those whose subtle vision manifests as all the obstructions are refined away are among those in the heaven of good manifestation. Those who reach the ultimately subtle level come to the end of the nature of form and emptiness and enter into a boundless realm. They are among those in the heaven of ultimate form. Ananda, those in the four dhyanas and even the rulers of the gods at these four levels can only pay their respects through having heard of the beings in the heavens of no return. They cannot know them or see them, just as the coarse people of the world cannot see the places where the arhats abide in holy way places, deep in the wild and mountainous areas. Ananda, in these eight in heavens are those who practice only non-involvement and have not yet gotten rid of their shapes, as well as those who have reached a level of no return. This is called the form realm. Further, Ananda, from this summit of the form realm, there are also two roads. Those who are intent upon renunciation discover wisdom. The light of their wisdom becomes perfect and penetrating, so that they can transcend the defiling realms, accomplish arahatship, and enter the Bodhisattva vehicle. They are among those called great arahats who have turned their minds around. Those who dwell in the thought of renunciation and who succeed in renunciation and rejection realize that their bodies are an obstacle. If they thereupon obliterate the obstacle and enter into emptiness, they are among those at the station of emptiness. For those who have eradicated all obstacles, there is neither obstruction nor extinction. Then there remains only the alaya consciousness. And half of the subtle functions of the manas, these beings are among those at the station of boundless consciousness. Those have already done away with emptiness and form, eradicate the conscious mind as well. In extensive tranquility of the ten directions, there is nowhere at all to go. These beings are among those at the station of nothing whatsoever. When the nature of the consciousness does not move, Within extinction, they exhaustively investigate. Within the endless, they discern the end of the nature. It is as if it were there and yet not there, as if it were ended and yet not ended. They are among those at the station of neither thought nor non-thought. These beings who dwell exhaustively into emptiness, but never fathom the principle of emptiness, go from the heaven of no return down this road which is a dead end to sagehood. They are among those known as dull arhats who do not turn their minds around, just like those in the heaven of no thought and the heavens of externalists who become engrossed in emptiness and do not want to come back. These beings are confused, prone to outflows and ignorant. They will accordingly enter the cycle of rebirth again. Ananda, each and every being in all these heavens is ordinary. They are still answerable for the karmic retribution. When they have answered for their debts, they must once again enter rebirth. The lords of these heavens, however, are all bodhisattvas who roam in samadhi. They gradually progress in their practice and make transferences to the way cultivated by all sages. Ananda, these are the four heavens of emptiness where the bodies and minds of the inhabitants are extinguished, the nature of concentration emerges, and they are free of the karmic retribution of form. This final group is called the formless realm. The beings in all of them have not understood the wonderful enlightenment of the bright mind. The accumulation of falseness brings into being false existence in the three realms. Within them, they falsely follow along and become submerged in the seven destinies, as pugilas they gather together with their own species or kind. 
Furthermore, under the four categories of asuras in the triple realm, those in the path of ghosts, who use the strength to protect their dharma, and who can write the spiritual penetrations to enter into emptiness, are asuras born from eggs. They belong to the destiny of ghosts. Those have fallen in virtue and have been dismissed from the heavens, dwell in places near the sun and moon. The asuras born from wombs and belong to the destiny of humans. The asura kings who uphold the world with a penetrating power and fearlessness they fight for position with the Brahma Lord, the God Chakra, and the four heavenly kings. These asuras come into being by transformation and belong to the destiny of gods. Ananda, there is another basic category of asuras. They have thoughts of the great seas and live submerged in underwater caves. During the day they roam in emptiness. At night they return to their watery realm. These asuras come into being because of moisture and belong to the destiny of animals. Ananda, so it is that when the seven destinies of hell dwellers, hungry ghosts, animals, people, spiritual immortals, gods and asuras are investigated in detail, they are all found to be murky and embroiled in conditioned existence. Their births come from false thoughts. Their subsequent karma comes from false thoughts. Within the wonderful perfection of the fundamental mind, that is without any doing, they are like strange flowers in space, for there is basically nothing to be attached to. They are entirely vain and false, and they have no source or beginning. Ananda, these living beings who do not recognize their fundamental mind, all undergo rebirth for limitless kalpas. They do not attain true purity because they keep getting involved in killing, stealing and lust or because they counter them and are born according to their not killing, not stealing and lack of lust. If these three karmas are present in them, they are born among the troops of ghosts. If they are free of these three karmas, they are born in the destiny of gods. The incessant fluctuation between the presence and absence of these karmas gives rise to the cycle of rebirth. For those who make the wonderful discovery of samadhi, neither the presence nor the absence of these karmas exists in that magnificent eternal stillness. Even their non-existence is done away with. Since the lack of killing, stealing and lust is non-existent, how could there be actual involvement in deeds of killing, stealing and lust? Ananda, those who do not cut off the three karmas each have their own private share. Because each has a private share, private shares come to be accumulated, making collective portions. Their location is not arbitrary, yet they themselves are falsely produced. Since they are produced from falseness, they are basically without a cause, and thus they cannot be traced precisely. You should warn cultivators that they must get rid of these three delusions if they want to cultivate Bodhi. If they do not put an end to these three delusions, then even the spiritual penetrations they may attain are merely a worldly conditioned function. If they do not extinguish these habits, they fall into the path of demons. Although they wish to cast out the false, they become doubly deceptive instead. The dust come one says that such beings are pitiful. You have created this falseness yourself. It is not the fault of body. An explanation such as this is proper speech. Any other explanation is the speech of demon kings.